So let me start by saying, uh, this is Max Liu. I'm one of the co-organizer and I'm the logistic guy here today and technical guy. I'll try to make sure that uh, our session runs smooth. And before uh, we I pass it on to Professor Fong to give us an opening speech, uh, I just want to first of all say, you know, all of our attendees have the option to ask questions throughout the events. And uh, your question will be seen on the back end at the, and the, during the last section, uh, Professor Fong will select uh, as uh, try to select as many of them to answer as possible. And also throughout the session, we have, uh, this is our uh, agenda. We have three polls with some very simple and straightforward questions. And we would love to uh, hear your thoughts on some of the, uh, the poll questions we have. And right now I'm going to launch the first poll so everyone can sort of see uh, what it looks like and you can try to uh, answer the poll. Uh, for each poll, we will give, you know, about a minute or so to answer. And after that, re the result will be shared with everyone live. And uh, our panelists could engage them in our discussion uh, if they find something surprising or interesting. So I see people are over half, 50% 50 of people have voted already. That's great. It's only 30 wow. seconds. And... Uh, yeah, please all vote. And I know we, there will be more people joining the session as we as time goes, but uh, because we have a very packed schedule today, so we will have to start uh, on time. I'm going to close the poll in 10 seconds now. Okay. So it's been a minute and uh, the poll is closed. So can everyone see the results? I hope everyone can see wow. the results. So with that fresh results in mind, I would like to pass it on to Professor Fong to give us an opening speech. Ah, good morning. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, as the case may be, since the audience uh, are coming from all corners of the world. Uh, my name is Dashuan Feng. Uh, the only important information uh, I like to present about myself is I grew up in Singapore and did my tertiary education in the United States. And for the last, uh, bef uh, before I came back to uh, the United States, I spent 10 years in, in Taiwan and in Macau. The two distinguished speakers we have today are Dr. Tony Chan and Dr. Ng Chai, uh, Ng Chai Tan. In, it is interesting that intellectually, both are mathematicians by training. Tony was a former president of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, a, of course, a world-renowned institution now, and uh, Ng Chai, is and, and currently the president of uh, of King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, and we'll call it KAUST from now on. And, and Tony is currently the president of National University of Singapore. I think the transformation of NUS, which is National University of Singapore, HKUST, and KAUST as leading research universities happen in the 21st century. So therefore the title of this webinar. Perhaps the best word to describe the, the um, genesis of the webinar is serendipity. We have no sponsors, but the inner enthusiasm of three individuals who are passionate about higher education, both in the East and the West, it just happened from the, uh, <clears throat> from the grassroots. It is the culmination of the higher education corporation of these three individuals who happen to be friends and share some common aspirations regarding the meaning of higher education in general and in Asia in particular. It literally began after I read the three remarkable and informative books by Tony, uh, namely Out of the Box 1 and 2 and A President's Vision. What was discussed in these three volumes profoundly 
resonated with my 10 years of experience I encountered in Asia. As I was basking in my resonance with what Tony's book were, were telling me, I recall a speech delivering, delivered by the NGI in a higher education forum, which I was the organizer a few years ago. One of the guidelines we gave to the speakers who were all senior leaders of the universities in Asia Pacific, that we wanted them to speak about the, their inner views about higher education and not just about the universities they are at the time leading. Enchai, who was then the provost of NUS, gave a marvelous speech about the vision, about his vision and meaning of higher education. That speech discussed at length the profound meaning of how NUS aims to educate young people from across the world in the 21st century. Ever since I returned to the United States three years, almost three years now, I was dismayed that one cannot hear the voice that Asian higher education is fast on the rise. So at a moment of weakness, I reach out to the both of them, where, which happens to be my friends, and are currently the leaders of top Asian universities to see whether they would be willing to enter into a Zoom webinar. I was absolutely flabbergasted that despite the time demand on them in running their universities, both agreed with me that the moment has arrived for the world to see and hear such a voice, the voice of higher education in Asia in the 21st century. Today, we are elated that we are able to capture the interest of such a vast and eclectic group of global participants with profound interest in the aspiration of Asia higher education. Here on the screen is the in, in, incomplete list of institutions and organizations that our registrants come from. I'm sure your intellectual and active particip participation of the webinar could turn, a, could turn a new page in the almanac of higher education in Asia in the 21st century. We will begin our webinar with a quick introduction, well, 15 minutes, by Professor Chen and Professor Dan, respectively. Then we will have 40 minutes of panel discussions, followed a 20 minutes of Q&A. Before I end my introduction, I must thank Max Liu for the technical as well as other support. Thank you. Tony. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dajuan. Thank you all for joining this webinar. It's uh, both an honor and privilege for me to have this opportunity to speak to all of you about a topic that has occupied my mind ever since I entered university administration about two decades ago. On this first slide are two photos. One is that of Taos, my current employer, and the other one is actually UST, my former one. So the two universities share many similarities uh, beyond actually their acronym differ by only one character. They both have K and UST. And uh, I will speak more about this uh, similarity later. Can you go to slide two, please, Max? Slide two, yeah. So my career in education over the past five decades has taken me from Asia to the US, back to Asia, and now in the Middle East. I have worked and lived both the East and the West. This background has given me a unique perspective on the topic today. In fact, I had a weekly newspaper column for the last five years when I was at Lecture UST, and I wrote an article on this topic called The Rise of the Asian Universities, uh, which can be found T-O-N-Y-F-C-H-A-N, so Tony F. Chan, that's my name, dot U-S-T dot H-K. 
if you go to that site, you'll find all the articles in there, the one that Dashran mentioned and so on. So next slide, Asia has a long history of higher education with some university close to a thousand years old. But the rise of Asian university on the global scene is a relatively recent phenomenon. Until relatively recently, the West has been both the model and the, and the destination for university and students from the East. I myself is an example. In my view, there are several key reasons behind this recent rise. One is the rise of Asian economies in recent decades. Rising economies creates need as well as provides the necessary resources to fund quality higher education. Besides funding, there's also a corresponding rise of expectation from both society and government. Government expects universities to be the engine for economic growth. In moving from a low-cost manufacturing economy to a knowledge-based one, a new type of workforce is needed, equipped with new skill sets, innovative and entrepreneurial mindset, and a global outlook. A rising middle class, primed on rising living standards, expects better jobs with better pay and working condition. Therefore, a university education has become necessary to secure a good job, and therefore citizens can afford and are willing to pay for it. Governments are also realizing that to create a knowledge-based economy requires investment in research as well as innovation. Universities are a central component of this ecosystem. This everybody sees as a virtuous cycle. Now in the five bullets under the item D, I list some example of this trend. The four Asian tigers have invested heavily in this ecosystem, and you can see the results. For example, Singapore, of which uh, Ng Chai is uh, president of NUS, has two universities that have risen rapidly and are now ranked among the best in the world, in the top 20, in the top 25, depending on who ranks it. Taiwan and Korea have some of the world's foremost technology companies. For example, TSMC and Samsung, among the best and most powerful in the world. I think nobody would have predicted this even three decades ago. And Hong Kong, as many of you know, has developed into a global financial hub. Now, the universities in China have probably risen the most dramatically over the last two decades. I would say two decades ago, no Chinese university were ranked among the top 100 globally. And now Tsinghua is number one in Asia and number 20 globally in the recent uh, times, I think, uh, sort of, uh, ranking. And 10-year-old Sustec, which is in Shenzhen, is now ranked number two among all universities in the world under 50 years old. And they're only 10 years old. India, it's one of the largest population in this uh, globe, has more than double its famous uh, IITs, Indian Institute of Technologies. More than double, only in the last decade or so. And there are also new private universities being created with big ambition and endowment. Japan has probably the longest history in Asia of westernization of its universities since the Meiji Restoration. It has made sustained investment in research and education over decades. The result and one aspect of it can be seen in the number of Nobel laureates from Japan. I counted at least one every year for the past decade. Korea has moved from one of the poorest economies after World War II to one of the most advanced today, especially in technology sectors. It has the government, as well as private companies such as POSCO, uh, investing in top technologically oriented universities like Kais and POSTEC. They are highly re regarded globally today. The Middle East, where I am now, is some of the world's oldest institutions of learning. Uh, some over a millennium old. But the more recent, I was characterized as oil-supported economies, have led to the establishment of many new USTs focused on technology and science. And many of these follow a model of East plus West. And almost all of them are aligned with ambitious national plans. Next slide, please. So in this slide, I, uh, I like to highlight my personal view of some of the characteristics of Eastern versus Western culture 
as expressed in their university. Now, this is very personal. It's my own personal view. The differences can be found in the emphasis on the one hand, individualism versus society on the other hand, from Asian culture. On liberal education, emphasizing critical thinking and creativity versus utilitarian goals, rote learning in exams. On academic freedom and institutional autonomy on the one hand, versus the role of government in both funding and governance on the other. On the diversity of the types of university, such as public and private, and partnership between public and private sector. And finally, on the accepted role of university in society, whether it is for talent development, knowledge creation, and thought leadership right, in most Western uh, elite university, versus job training and economic development, probably more the trend in Asia, at least in the development, uh, de developing uh, economies. Of course, this is not a zero one divide and one finds everything on the whole spectrum. And part of the differences is due to differences in culture, tradition, and history. Now, next slide, please. So the next slide, I want to give a, sort of two case studies. And these are the two universities that I've been associated with. So the first one is uh, HAUST. It's just under 30 years old. Uh, it is now, you know, since I'm not no longer present, I can say that it's quite highly ranked. You know, you can see them there, QS number 27, Young University, number one. I think young means 50 years or younger. Uh, this one surprised a lot of people. Actually, USD has had either the number one or number two executive MBA program as ranked by Financial Times for the last 10 years, either number one or number two. And in terms of global employability, ranked by Times, it's number 10 in the world. It's only gone up. So it tells you a little bit about the Asian economy and the job and the employability. Which UST I would characterize as medium size. It's about 16,000 undergrads. 20% are international students. 6,000 uh, postgrads, sorry. Uh, about 700 faculty. Uh, it's not comprehensive. It's very focused. It's only four schools. It has science, engineering, business, and humanities and social sciences. It's international and English only in terms of instruction and official language. Now, many people ask me, even today, certainly when I was president, what's the secret of success for a place like HAUST? And, and uh, those of you who know Chinese, you can see I put there, ten li ren he, or in English is timing, location, and talent. So let me emphasize, uh, uh, dwell on that a bit. So one is the vision. So HAUST was founded in, uh, was founded in 1991, but it was being planned in the 80s. And in the 80s, we already known that Hong Kong will be returned to China. So, so Hong Kong's role in the rising China was one of the main reasons why HKUSD was created. It was meant to emphasize on innovation and technology because Hong Kong sees that it has go up the knowledge base value chain. It cannot be just low cost manufacturing. In fact, today, Hong Kong has basically no, no manufacturing. Timing, uh, nobody could predict back then, even the, the, the China that we're seeing today, the economy. One country, two system. That was like uh, a historical timing. And there's something called the Greater Bay Area. GBA stands for Greater Bay Area. So it's, a, it's an area signed from Hong Kong, Shenzhen to Guangzhou and Macau. And is uh, we look at the size and population and GB, uh, GDP is bigger than the other Bay Area that we can imagine. You know, Silicon Valley or the Tokyo Bay Area and so on. So that's the timing. Talent is international. Hong Kong is an international city. Uh, a system is very important. So Hong Kong has been a British colony for over, uh, let's say, 150 years. So it has sort of the, in a way, component for both the East and the West. Okay, it's uh, very British. When I, when I returned to Hong Kong, I found it very British. It's interesting. And the last but not least, we need resources to have a good university system. So in Hong Kong, the university was built by the Royal Jockey Club, which is part of, it's not government, but, it's, but now it's the Jockey Club. And they built it in three years. It's amazing speed. And of course, now it's a publicly funded university. So the government spends money. So that's HKUST. You can see that it's tied to the, the rise of Hong Kong in terms of its economy is tied to historical 
a moment of you know returning to Asia, one country, two system, and now looking to the future is the Greater Bay Area. That's the big thing. Now, KAUST is even younger. KAUST is only 10 years old. It was founded in 2009. Uh, we are not ranked by Times or QS because we do not have undergraduate, but we ask uh, time to sort of simulate a ranking for us. If we were ranked, what would we be? You know, we were in the top 100. That's what they tell us. Okay. Uh, we have uh, been the number one cited in terms of university in the world per faculty. We were very, very small by QS. And Nature Index sort of ranked us like number 18 in, in the Nature Index uh, normalized ranking. We don't have undergrads. We're small. You know, we're, we are, I always like to tell people we are, we are like Caltech, where I went to undergrad, without undergrads, okay? It's like Caltech, which is very small. We have right now about 180 faculty, uh, 1,300 students, 75% of PhDs, about one-third a Saudi student, about one-third a female student for UST. I think that's very striking. But we have a large number of research people, like postdocs, uh, research staff, and so on. We are small, so we are very flat administratively. We have no departments. We only have three divisions. We have a uh, physical science and engineering. We have biological and environmental science. We have a sort of computer and mathematically based science, which includes electrical engineering. That's it. We don't have medical school. We don't have uh, business school and so on. It's international and English. We have a dual mission. We have, of course, graduate research and education, but we also have innovation and economic development as part of our goal. And we have a science park on our campus, for example. We train entrepreneurs, we have, uh, you know, startup, you know, spin-off, spin-in, and so on. We also focused, we have focused on five research themes. You see them there, energy, water, food, health, and environment. And since I came, we added digital. I think the first four, you can see energy, the, U, uh, the Saudi uh, Arabia has plenty in the ground, but there's not a lot of fresh water, it's difficult to grow food, and there's a harsh environment. So in a way, that's, those are area, I think, of global interest, but of special interest to Saudi Arabia. And digital, you see AI and so on, uh, everybody is interested in. Now, the corresponding vision uh, and so on is, it's created as a house of wisdom. This is uh, a thousand years ago, uh, the Islamic center of wisdom is in Baghdad. And so the, the King Abdullah wanted to re resurrect this wisdom. You invite the best from around the world, pursue, uh, pursuit of knowledge. It is, uh, I describe it in shorthand, it's like, it's like Caltech plus the uh, National Science Foundation. We have our own funding agency. We have our own big research labs. So it's like a US national lab. And we have our science park. It's like Silicon Valley. So it's all, all combined into one, self-contained. We're seen as a nation of cultural change. In terms of timing, the, even a decade ago, the kingdom sees that we have to diversify from the oil economy. And now Saudi Arabia has a strategic plan for the country called Vision 2030. Talent is international. I think it's striking. It's a small body, student body, right? We have 51 nationality from, for our faculty and 81 nationality for our students in a small student body. The system is we are, we are privately, we are funded by an endowment. Uh, so it's independent of the government. We don't get a national a yearly budget from the government. And the administrative system is Western and the academic system. And uh, so you see here is a new economy is tied to a national plan. I think that in a national ambition and where they have to pivot their economy away from, from the traditional uh, oil uh, based economy. Let me go to the last slide and quickly I want to finish. So the question is, will, uh, what's the outlook? Will Asian university continue to rise or even surpass Western? Uh, the survey gave a very optimistic uh, picture. I don't have a crystal ball, but here I outline some of the challenges I see Asian university will have to will encounter, will have to overcome if they were to continue their rise. First, I think the West will still serve as a model and an inspiration for Asian university for a long time to come. The challenge for Asian university is how to borrow the right features from the West and integrate it into its own culture, tradition, and national needs. The next challenge is how to break out of the constraint imposed by Asian history and culture. For example, the question has been raised whether liberal education can thrive and be accepted in Asia. Except examples such as Yale NUS and the Yuanpei College in Beida, 
uh, experiments in progress. The third challenge is how to overcome expectation and perception of stakeholders. For students, it is jobs versus learning and growth. For parents, it's return on investment, risk versus stability, and old perception of quality of Eastern University versus the West. For employer, is what kind of university graduate they want to hire. Did they want to hire skills or did they want to hire minds? For government, it is time scale. Politics is short term, but university is a long term. The fourth challenge is to recognize that university is only one component of the education, research, and innovation ecosystem. Okay. University needs the other component to grow together with it for it to thrive. Finally, there are challenges of how to draw global talent. Would the rest of the world come to Asia to study like they have been going to the West? How do you nurture innovation and creativity as these cannot really be taught in the classroom and tested in exams? And the big question of the time is, what about the effect of COVID-19? Thank you, I stop here, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, and Chai? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me try to share screen. Wow, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening uh, to the audience. I want to thank uh, Ta Xuan for organizing this uh, webinar. Ta Xuan is a very good friend, and of course, I have uh, respected him a lot. Uh, he has been a very senior uh, and well-connected uh, visionary uh, academic leader. Uh, Tony has uh, highlighted actually many of the key ingredients. So I shall be uh, brief and uh, basically sort of uh, give some indications uh, to support uh, some of Tony's uh, statement or reinforce some of his statements. Uh, if you use ranking as a sort of a proxy, uh, and uh, all of us uh, administrators know that uh, ranking has to be taken with a pinch of salt. Uh, rankings are highly uh, correlated to research indicators, research funding, publications, uh, and uh, they provide a facet on the development of universities. Uh, but to the public, this is a very useful sort of uh, reference to find out whether which universities are better than the others. So if you use ranking as a sort of a proxy to see whether universities are have reason, then uh, just a comparison over four years, five years actually, uh, it's quite evident. Uh, the QS ranking, for instance, indicates an increase of six over just a period of five years under the QS ranking amongst the top 100. Uh, the THE in the top 500 uh, has an increase in 14 from 67 to 81. Right. And of course, if you break down according to countries, then you can actually uh, see which other countries uh, have actually been accelerating this rise. Uh, China comes to mind. Uh, in 2011, there are only two universities in the PHE top 100. But uh, just about 10 years later, in 2021, there are six. And uh, Tsinghua and Peta are the top two, all right, in uh, Asia. So uh, China, of course, uh, has a reason in terms of uh, these numbers, but so have actually other uh, countries too. Now, I would then sort of provide uh, a, a sense of why at least for Singapore, we uh, managed to do well. Uh, some of the reasons are quite characteristic across uh, many universities. So importance of education is definitely one. But of course, in terms of intensity, how much and how far governments are willing to support universities. Uh, 
that actually do make a difference. And there are, of course, differences across countries. The second point is the growing investment in research. Now, pretty much every country uh, has a research strategy. And uh, in line with what Tony has mentioned, that uh, we are actually now moving into develop, developing countries, moving from a manufacturing economy to a knowledge economy and the importance of research and innovation, especially carried through research institutes and higher education institutes are critical. Uh, so many countries have uh, tied their research investment according to their GDP. So for instance, Thailand, a country that is near to Singapore, uh, has a 20 year national development strategy stretching from 2017 to 2036. And uh, this strategy uh, hopes to increase the spending for research from 1% of the, to, you know, from the current 0.5% to about 1% or 1.5% of GDP of Thailand. And uh, other indicators are the number of researchers uh, which Thailand hopes to double from say the number in uh, 2016, about 12.9 per 10,000 to double to about 25 per 10,000, right? Another sort of uh, country where, which puts a lot of attention on research is uh, our neighbor, Malaysia. Uh, the, in 2018, the gross expenditure on research and development reaches 1.5% of Malaysia's uh, GDP, which is about 12 billion uh, US dollars. And uh, Malaysia have seen, say in the five years leading to 2018, a very fast growth in terms of top 10% most cited publications. In fact, the cumulative average growth rate is close to 13% per year over five years. So we can see actually, a lot of countries with this investment have actually resulted in very uh, sharp rise in their outputs. Uh, many countries too have uh, a policy for talent. Uh, Singapore uh, is a very small country. Uh, we are limited in terms of our talents. So we, uh, in order to be competitive, uh, we have to adopt a very uh, open uh, policy for talent. Uh, that's why if you look at our universities, uh, we have actually a high proportion of uh, colleagues who are from uh, foreign countries. Now this open policy for talent has helped Singapore tremendously. And the fourth, important factor is that Singapore is actually very well connected. So are, I think the major cities in many of the countries, be it uh, uh, China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam and Thailand. And uh, uh, while I think it is now more threatening that globalization may uh, sort of uh, be, be hindered because of the tensions, but uh, we, we feel that uh, that connectedness will still be able to try uh, in different ways and different forms. But at least in Singapore, connectedness is very critical uh, and uh, that has helped us and gel very well with the open ten, uh, policy that we have for talent. Finally, uh, Universities in Singapore uh, have autonomy. So in the past, uh, we report to the Ministry of Education, but in 2006, uh, that is about 14 years ago, uh, the government was enlightened to establish universities as private, not-for-profit companies. And while the governments fund the universities pretty generously. 
close to about 70%. Uh, the government actually uh, have specific indicators for universities to meet and the government provides tremendous autonomy for universities in Singapore. And I think this is another one differentiator uh, the, that Singapore has. And of course, after 2006, uh, we have also seen universities in, uh, in Japan, as well as in Korea, also given autonomy. Uh, so that flexibility to free up the university so that they can compete globally, uh, that seems to position uh, universities well. So this, this I, I would summarize the five factors that are important for the success of uh, Singaporean universities. And as I've said, uh, some factors are already present in many of the Asian countries. And uh, if you have many more of these factors, plus others, uh, I think the rise of Asian universities will continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inchai, uh, and also Tony. I think both Thank of you, you have uh, painted a uh, comprehensive picture of some of the um, strength and some of the issues confronting Asian universities now. Um, I have an interesting question, which I'd like to pose to both of you. I think uh, Tony briefly mentioned a name Elliot earlier in his speech, but he did not tell you who Elliot is or was. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a remarkable guy. Uh, he was Harvard's president. His name is Charles Eliot, who happened to be a cousin of T.S. Eliot, uh, the famous poet. And he, it, around uh, 2003, when the president of Yale University, Dick Levin, gave a talk in China, he actually gave tremendous, uh, tremendous praise about Eliot. By the way, Eliot was a president of Harvard from 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1868, uh, 69 until 1909. So uh, what that's telling you, and, and of course the standard statement is that um, Eliot made Harvard. Before Eliot, Harvard is nothing, and after Eliot, Harvard is something. Um, so that means that for both of you, you will have to be around for 40 years as the president of your respective universities. Um, <laughs> what, what he said was uh, the following. He wrote a very interesting, uh, and, and, and Dick Levin actually said the following. He said, Elliot said the following, a university in any worthy sense of the term must grow from seed. It cannot be transplanted from England or Germany, because at that time, England and Germany were the, the, the top in, in the world, in full leave and bearing. Indeed, slight modifications of this sentence and render it will be suitable for Asia, I think. Does this or should this comment be equally applicable to Asia? Does higher education in Asia with globalization in mind, which but the both of you have, uh, have discussed so eloquently and so comprehensively should have an Asian ambience, or should it? Uh, who would like to start with the answer? Well, I, I can start. Okay. Uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, it depends on the stage of development of the universities. Right. Uh, Asians, countries, I think we are hungry. We are in uh, a catch-up phase. And of course, uh, we are very well aware that uh, US and Europe has been way ahead of us. And, uh, but I think Asian countries are always eager to learn. 
Um, and you notice that in the last half of the 20th century, uh, a lot of the academics in Asian universities are actually trained in US and Europe, right? And I think there is still quite a lot of uh, young academics being trained uh, in US and Europe, and that are returning uh, to their Asian home countries. So this has actually tremendously benefited. And when they return, uh, it is impossible to just copy everything that the West uh, has done. Very often you can't copy everything, but you adapt. You adapt what you think is best for your environment uh, and you progress from that. And I do, do see that that's the case when uh, you know you learn from the best practices and you adapt, bring over and you adapt. I think this phase will continue for a while, right? Uh, I would love to see the day where uh, young academics are actually trained in some of the top places in Asian universities. Right. And that's when I think uh, we will start to have our own sort of characteristics. And you'll be wonderful, of course, if in future, uh, young academics in good universities or top universities from Europe and US are being trained in uh, top Asian universities. So you have a sort of a reverse flow. Uh, I'd love to see a day like that. Thank you. Tony? Yeah, uh, by the way, I agree with uh, Ng Chai. That, that, that will take a long time to come, but, uh, but I certainly would like to see that myself. And there's no reason why not to, right? You know, Asia is the growing economy. If you want to do business, you, you, you have to sort of get to know the place. And what's better than studying over there and you get to know it. I mean, that's how, you know, you and I went to the West, right? In China, and yep. and uh, Dashuan too. I, let me give two examples about this, uh, the Charles Eliot's, uh, you know, quote. Uh, you know, one is uh, uh, the expectation or the perception that I mentioned. Let's say take entrepreneurship, which, you know, in the Western realm is sort of capturing a lot of imagination. You know, we're using Zoom. Okay, you know, you talk about Zoom is a typical, by the way, is a Chinese entrepreneur, you know, Chinese American, I, I assume. So, but in Asia, when I was in HKUSD in Hong Kong for the last decade, uh, still a big part of society, especially the older generation, uh, uh, are skeptical about entrepreneurship because it's seen as uh, risky, because it is risky, right? It's uh, if you try, you know, maybe one out of 10 might actually make it, you know, uh, uh, and so on. And so many of the parents uh, class would advise the student class to don't try this, you know, get a steady job in a, in a known profession. I mean, that's sort of the idea. So if the government want to push for kind of knowledge-based uh, economy, you need people who are entrepreneurial, who can who knows what's happening what's happening around the world and and strike out on their own you encountering this other sort of uh, i think will change over time it would depend on the stage of development of the economy i mean i'm sure uh, so that's that's just one example so stability versus risk taking the risk appetite and the perception of it the other one i mentioned earlier is also about liberal arts uh, education uh, so I said, you know, Asian university, by the way, examination was invented by Chinese, if I, I was told. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know, in the Ming dynasty or something like that, you know, it was invented by Chinese. So we, those of us who grew up in Asia would know, you know, the sort of the examination culture has left a deep mark in our psyche, okay? So, and you combine with that, uh, so the question is, if you teach a liberal arts education, which like Yale and US are trying to do. You know, I've visited at least a couple of times. The question is, would, would that fit culturally? Would the best student 
choose to select this because the career prospect is less certain. I mean, in the West, you can look at many successful people, okay? They're, they're undergraduate, you know, what the field of study is, anything, you know, it could be, uh, I actually had an example where a, a surgeon uh, study comparative literature in their undergraduate years and they sort of, you know, switch. It's much less common in, in Asia, okay? And so, for example, in, uh, in Hong Kong, I can speak, but I think probably in Singapore too, when you graduate from high school, you can immediately go into what in the U.S. is referred to as professional schools. You can choose to be a doctor, to be a lawyer, to be a businessman, and so on and so forth, where, you know, if you go to Harvard, you cannot choose those, right? They, you know, you're supposed to study, you know, mathematics or study psychology or history or whatever, okay? It was very different uh, perspective. So, I, so those are two examples. So you cannot just copy and you say, you want half your student to be entrepreneur when they graduate. That's not gonna work in Asia, at least not right now, okay? Mm -hmm. Or you stop people from going into the profession. You say you should not study medicine when you are 17 years old, even though you can make many you know, reasonable arguments and you can quote you know, uh, like US, but the society is not gonna follow you because they know, you know they have different considerations. So those are two examples I can, I can you know, quote as a personal example. If I can follow up uh, to what uh, Tony, he brought up two interesting facets. Uh, one is innovation. Uh, I do think that uh, there are actually many interesting places in uh, Asia where innovation is actually a uh, thriving. Uh, so if you look at Shenzhen in China, for instance, it's an extremely innovative place. Uh, and for certain areas and technologies, uh, it could be even more vibrant than the traditional hotspots like uh, Silicon Valley, uh, New York City, and Toronto. So uh, I think the potential is tremendous. Uh, and uh, basically, I think you need the government and you also need people who are hungry. Uh, on the liberal arts education, uh, I, I thought that uh, I should clarify that uh, in fact, when we started the negotiations with Yale on the liberal education in Singapore, uh, we are very mindful that we cannot have a copy of the U.S. liberal education in Singapore because the cultural context is extremely different, right? Uh, so uh, that also impinges on the spread uh, and diversities that uh, we insist on the curriculum. So our positioning is really a liberal arts education for Asia, right? That's how we position the Yale and US. So for instance, in the humanities, where the typical liberal arts colleges would typically uh, focus on the European canon of the literature, uh, the Yale and US included Chinese as well as Indian uh, and also Middle Eastern uh, uh, literature to, to provide that sort of a diversity. And in, in, in fact, uh, we try to make sure that uh, at all times, uh, focus is on Asia. Uh, and, and that, uh, I... I agree, it's uh, sometimes hard to convey and hard to sort of indicate because we use a generic term yeah. to grow education. Thank you. Yeah, but, yeah. so Dashan, I want to follow up just quickly, okay? So okay. first of all, I wish you and you are to be very successful because it will be a role model for, I think, the rest of Asia. I want to, coming back to entrepreneurship and this mindset, I have used this as an example, as a thought experiment. So imagine, we all know about Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, right? Drop out from Harvard after one year and founded Microsoft and Facebook. So imagine an Asian student from, a, let's say, a traditional society who's studying at Harvard. And they decided, they tell their parents, so I'm going to drop out after one year and we'll found a company that we don't know what it's going to be. How many Asian parents will allow that? Okay, or I think that's really have, the litmus test. Or have heart attacks. Or have heart attacks. <laughs> okay, okay. That, that I think is an example. Yeah. 
Well, okay. I, I, I mean, if I can quickly add, you know, that uh, uh, a lot of Asians are actually learning innovation and then bringing them into Asia, right? So a lot of the, for instance, uh, the current Minister for Education, uh, Nadim, right? Uh, he set up, you know, a unicorn in Indonesia and he was a graduate of uh, uh, Harvard. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Likewise, I think in Singapore, we have uh, Forrest Lee, a graduate from uh, Stanford, and uh, Ye Kang, a graduate from CMU. They set up the C group, which is now again a unicorn. So I think there are many, many examples where, again, you know, it, it follows, uh, it's trained in the West, but they set up business in Asia and they thrive in Asia. Very good. Any more follow-ups? Okay. Um, <clears throat> both of you have um, emphasized the word autonomy in your respective universities. Um, when I was in Taiwan for seven years, uh, the joke in Taiwan's higher education was that we don't have universities of respective names what we have is University of Ministry of Education. In other words, there is very, very strong control of the Ministry of Education. Um, the, the, the Chinese words that I learned to, that everyone fear when I was in Taiwan, whenever we talk about the Ministry of Education, is that we, we heard the word bao bu, which is report to the ministry. In other words, everything you do, you have to report to the ministry to get approval. Uh, autonomy is maybe, I, I think that uh, NUS and, uh, and HKUST and presumably KAUST, and also I know that uh, uh, National University of Korea uh, have, have instituted this autonomy. But in general, Many universities in Asia, including those in China, for example, Tsinghua, Beida, uh, they, they are very, very strongly controlled by the Ministry of Education. And so autonomy is perhaps an important question. Can you elaborate on that? I, can I take that up first, Aung Chai? Yeah. Yes, so I, I sort of hinted at that when I mentioned about the cultural differences, right? So one is uh, sort of individual based and the other one is societal based, right? So when you look, look like a collective, somehow you have that sort of individual autonomy of, or, or is less important than the societal one. I mean, it's just long history of tradition. The other one is the tradition is in many of the Asian economies, uh, they are still sort of, many of them are developing economies. So there's very much still driven by the government the economy. So the ministry actually is responsible for the planning, for the funding. Uh, and many university faculty are government employees, you know, in many countries around Asia. So it may be, to be fair to the government, maybe they don't see it as controlling. They see it as they're supporting, right? <laughs> they're supporting. <laughs> so, and, and, but you see that, that there is the, 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 the difference. So in fact, many of the more developed part of Asia, like Singapore is a perfect example. You know, in China to talk about it. I remember it's only like in the mid nineties. Is it the mid nineties? Or even closer, maybe 15 years ago, that Singapore reformed the governance structure of university. And Hong right. Kong also went through that. So in the idea is that you give more autonomy. So the university has its own board. It still gets the money from the government but it's a high level contract with the government. Then the internal management is the management plus the board. For example, in Saudi Arabia, so before KAUST, Saudi Arabia has about 35 million people. I mean, you know, there's, you know, maybe, I don't know, 60, 70 university, very large, some of them. Before KAUST, every university is part of the ministry. So KAUST is the first one that is independent because we're funded by an endowment. But recently, I mean, literally in this last year, there are at least three or four universities that are now independent. So they have their own board, 
you know, and, uh, and so on. So I think a lot of countries in Asia are realizing that you, you to be excellent, you need to let go a little bit. You know, it's like bringing up children, okay, <laughs> in a family, right? So you, you have to, you still have to support them, but you have to you know, let them have a little freedom so that they can develop. I think this is the challenge uh, for, for Asia. Yeah. And, and Chai? Um, so uh, I, I thought that the autonomy in Singapore, uh, it's a very enlightened move by our government. Uh, they provide us with substantial funding, like I said, about 70% of the budget. Uh, and uh, there are only two things that the government controls. One, the government decides on the tuition fees. Uh, so tuition fees are sort of the purview of the government. And two, they decide on how many students uh, we take in every year. Uh, there, there's of course a range. Uh, there is a sort of uh, floor and a cap, and you have to work within this range. So for instance, uh, NUS, which would not take in more than uh, 7,600 students per year and uh, must take in at least 7,100 a year, something to that effect, right? And uh, the number, of course, uh, comprised of a few other numbers, whether it is in humanities and social sciences, in architecture, in engineering, and so on and so forth. So, so that, these are the two things in which uh, the government actually has say on. But other than that, the budget is given to you. The university management has a free use of the budget. Right. We set our own compensation scheme. Uh, we decide on our own promotion, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we operate very much like a private university in the U.S. context. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to uh, add to Tony's point. Uh, I've been asked to give speeches on autonomy practices in Singapore, and. I usually uh, end with uh, close to what Tommy said. Tony said that the government needs to let go. <laughs> needs to learn how to let go. <laughs> because by controlling and uh, managing their universities too much, you are actually tying their hands. <laughs> but this is really an let, let me that the universe I, I, I want to yes. add a point, uh, that's right, if I am, okay. Of course, go ahead. And that is, I would say, to be engagement with government can be actually very good for university too. So it's not all, I mean, more than money. I mean, well, of course, we need the support, right, for most. I'll give you an example. So Saudi Arabia is the host for G20. You, you, you all know about G20, right? So it's hosting a lot of events. In fact, the big summit is in November. So because of Saudi Arabia is doing this, it is trying to get, for example, the university to be involved. For example, KAUST. So we are being you know, given the opportunity to participate in many of these events. So for example, KAUST is hosting uh, the S20. It stands for Science 20. So these are the G20 country, the National Academy of Sciences. And they get together. So there's no National Academy of Science in Saudi Arabia. So cows are sort of doing that. And we were engaged with this. You know, the, 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 we get engaged with the, um, planning the future of uh, you know, science and how it ties to country. Like, for example, uh, sustainability, how to preserve the coral reefs around the world, not just in the kingdom. So if we were completely independent of the country, we would not have this opportunity. So I think engagement with government is not you know, always just like for kids, okay? <laughs> They're still part of the family, so to speak. Any more follow-up? No. Okay. Um, uh, Tony, one of your friends, Albert Yip, do you know him? Do you remember him from HKUST? He was a board member. Yes. Uh, yes, of course, very, of course, of course. Yeah, he was my board question. member. <laughs> 
so technically he was your boss. Um, yeah. Hi, Albert, wherever you are. Okay. I, uh, uh, he asked a very interesting question and I'd like to embellish it a little bit more for what yes. he said. Um, I once visited a, a department at Technion, which is an Israeli university. Uh, and I noticed of the 20 faculty members that in that particular department, 19 have named chairs. In other words, uh, someone mm. in either Israel or Europe or United States uh, donated a, a, a bunch of money to the university to establish a chair and they use this money to attract someone to come and teach in the university. And of course, Asians uh, a donation for, Asians are very happy to donate, donate money to build buildings. Every building you see have a big name on top, but relatively few, am I, if, unless, I, unless things have changed in the last few years, relatively few endowed chairs are in, in, within Asian universities. And, and partly because why I'm, why I'm saying that and why I'm particularly picking up what Albert uh, wanted to know is that endowed chairs by itself may not mean very much, but it gives the impression of the intellectual ambience of the society, that they value the, the people, the quality of the people, and therefore they're willing to open up their wallet to, to bring in people like that for the universities. What about, what do you think of this comment? Uh, maybe start with Ain Chai. Oh, I fully agree. Uh, the chairs, uh, sort of raises the prestige you know, of academics, especially the academics who hold the chair. And it is a very useful uh, 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 mechanism to attract very top academics. Uh, we also have, do, do not have uh, sort of that many chairs. I think we, at NUS, we have about 60 uh, donated chairs. And we are hoping to sort of double this uh, and, uh, of course, when you talk about uh, raising funds, seeking donations, it's much harder in Asia than in, uh, say, the Western countries, particularly U.S. Uh, I think we have to slowly develop this culture of uh, having able people and alumni supporters to donate towards universities so that universities can build uh, endowments. Uh, Cho Chuan, who was the previous president, uh, he warned me that uh, once you become president, uh, the other part of your job is to be a professional beggar. <laughs> Over to you. Okay, let, 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 me, let me give you a Two examples. Okay, one is from UCLA, where I spend most of my career, and the other one is HAUST. So, if you pay attention, uh, what the physics Nobel, you know, was given to three people, right? One is Roger Penrose, uh, Penrose, and there are two other given to the, you know, they all involved involving the black hole. There was one given to a, a female faculty from UCLA. So I was the dean. I was her dean. I know her very well. So. Back when I was dean at UCLA, the Division of Physical Sciences said, I don't know, let's say 200 faculty. There were less than a handful of chairs. So this is not just limited to Asia. So in fact, I was involved over many years trying to raise a chair for this faculty who now just got the Nobel Prize. But back 10 years ago or 15 years ago, it was not easy, right? So I, I actually want to congratulate this this donor who actually had the foresight to fund this chair, now, you know, this holder holds the Nobel Prize. You talk about return on investment, but it's not about return on investment, it's about supporting great minds. To me, the money is actually not the issue. For example, you know, in terms of money, for example, at, at Kaos, we can fund, you know, we have, we have plenty of funding for, to, to support the, the, the chair holder, but the recognition from outside, I think that means a lot to the chairholder and also to the outside world. To me, that's important, okay? Now the HAUST example 
is this. So when I, in Hong Kong for the longest time, because I would say 20 some years ago, all universities are part of the government. You know, faculty are government employees. So there's all their salary is supported, right? There's no point about uh, getting this. So when I arrived at HKUST, this is just say 10 years ago, uh, there were maybe, if I remember, there were three chairs holders. There may be five chairs available, only three were occupied. So I coming from the US, of course, I take this as part of my job. So, so together with you know, other VPs, we raised, I forgot now, probably today, there's at least over 40 chairs today, okay? And it was not easy. I tell you, so when we went to talk to donors, they, as you said, right, Dashun, they say, well, I, I know my friend has a name on the building. <laughs> but what is this chair? You know, I, they don't understand this concept. So we actually try to say, well, you know, if this faculty win the Nobel Prize, you know, your name will be out there. <laughs> okay, but you, you, that's a long, long, long shot, right? So, so they that's really a, do that's not very understand. Non, but I think it's changing. That's very non-linear. It, but it's changing. I think now if you go to Hong Kong, right, we have, I think University of Hong Kong, which is the oldest university, they now have probably over 100 chairs. But it wasn't so. They probably had very few, say 30 years ago, probably close to very, very few. And they have a medical school. Medical school is easier to raise money. <laughs> if the doctor there saved you or your family's life, you really appreciate it. I mean, this is true and well-deserved, so to speak. So I think this will change, but it's not really for the money. It's for the engagement with society and the symbolic value, I think is more important. Yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, both of you. And I think that letting people talk about chairs and, and how important the person who holds the chair is a demonstration of the intellectual ambience and the intellectual breadth of the university and therefore the country. Um, mm -hmm. We have a very interesting question uh, from a European, uh, my good friend, uh, Ramon Wies from Sweden. And his question is the following. He said, I would say that you missed in your discussion of the West, the universities in Europe, outside of UK, it has no tuition. They are government funded mm -hmm. and strong traditions, possibly culturally in between Asia and US. And actually, via the Humboldt forming Humboldt, the, the Humboldt Foundation forming the role model of modern universities, also very different from U.S. liberal arts education. Uh, that seems to be another area that perhaps we could pay some attention to. Uh, Enchai. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually have been looking quite a lot at the European universities. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, I think we can learn from European universities is their very close linkage with industry, right? And say, for instance, in Germany, uh, they have applied universities and they have technical universities. Uh, and the uh, applied universities, even their technical universities, work very closely uh, with industry. Uh, and industry, uh, whenever they change, uh, the universities are able to adapt. Uh, this is actually very important uh, because we, we operate uh, in a model which I think it's not as useful uh, at this point in time, right? Uh, our university is probably a 18, 19, 20th century type of construct uh, where things move more slowly, more definitely. But if you look at the changes in the last 10 years or so, uh, it has been tremendous. Afforded, of course, by globalization, by technology. COVID-19 has basically accelerated a lot of these changes. Right. And uh, the industry is now changing uh, extremely rapidly. And the uh, universities, uh, I fear, they are, may not be in a position to respond as quickly and to prepare their students and their graduates 
for a very rapidly changing environment. So that, that we, we have to learn what are the best models. And I do see that European models do have this strong connection with industry, which I think all of us can learn. Over to you. Tony? Yeah, I want to comment on both. Uh, thank you very, very much for the question on this. So first one is about tuition. Uh, I, I, I want to tell you a personal experience, okay? So I once attended a conference as a speaker in the European University Association. So this is a large uh, association for European University or president. Who go, it was in uh, Warwick in UK, I remember, okay, maybe 10 years ago. And a big topic was tuition. And it was at a time when some country were proposing to charge tuition only a few countries, okay? And it was a heated debate. It, it, so I realized for the first time I sort of participate, I mean, I was listening, that this issue in Europe is more than about money. It's not about, you know, it, it's really a cultural and also part of the political system. It's whether, you know, this is part of public good, whether someone has to pay for it, it's who's to pay for it. So you pay for it through taxation and through the government, or should the benefit, you know, the student also contribute part of it? Because uh, in US, you have private university where basically you, the default is that you pay full tuition, right? So uh, in places like Hong Kong, I don't know, in Singapore, probably similar, it's subsidized. So everybody pays some tuition, but heavily subsidized, okay? So, I, so there's no right or wrong, uh, but I can say the following. That is no tuition, it's not without issues. I'll give you an example. So one of the boards that I serve, I just saw is uh, I was on the rector's uh, advisory board of University of Vienna. So they are part of the EU and uh, very, very well known, you know, uh, university, you know. You know, you go into the big hall, you have 10 Nobel laureates busts, you know, Sort of sitting there, you know, in over history in medicine and physics, uh, and and so on. But now, because it's part of it, no tuition, they, they have a particular problem. It is huge, because students do not want to graduate. This being a university, being a university student is actually a very comfortable, you know, station in life, because there's no tuition. They they do that, and the university cannot really. Like in Asia, you can, if you don't perform, you are out, right? So in, in Europe, that's a different culture, okay? You cannot do that. So, they are, so what they have is that you have a lot of students in certain majors, studies, and you have some really top students and other students who are within their mind is not there. You know what I mean? So you have this mixture and it's very difficult to, to manage. Uh, I, I think, so it's not without issues. Okay, those, that's, a, that's one. The other one is about the Humboldt uh, model. And of course, many of us uh, are very familiar with that. I would say, certainly for HKUSD and CALS, maybe also NUS, we are following the humble model. Right. Humble model, my understanding is that you integrate teaching with research. This right. is opposed to, say, in the old Soviet model, where you separate those two functions. And actually, in China, uh, not so long ago, uh, you know, in the, after the Second World War, after, right, they, they do that. So I think the humble model has been sort of adopted, not only in the West, but now in the East as well. So, so I think that has been proven. Ah, very good. Um, here's an interesting question uh, from someone from Kaust. Li Xiao Han. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, I know him, of okay. course. He's a faculty member. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, Xiao Han. Okay. He said, if people use the number of Nobel Prizes as a major factor to evaluate the success of the universities. The Japanese universities are very successful, probably second to the US, even with US, even one third of the population. But the Japanese universities have a very different characteristics from the US and the US influence universities like many new ones in Asia. They include strong government control, connection, less international diversity, 
and more local language and cultural orientation. What can other universities learn from the Japanese ones? Maybe Ng Chai, you let me answer this <laughs> first, because if someone, I have to be very careful. <laughs> uh, so the way I look, I actually hinted at that in my, in my talk. Uh, I interpreted it to mean that Japan had the foresight to invest in basic science for a long time, for over a century. It, it, it has nurtured a culture where they recognize the importance of pursuing those basic science. He probably recognized that it's important for the technology, the technological lead that Japan is still enjoying very much, okay? So that takes uh, knowledge and wisdom for the government to recognize that. Because if you look at, if you are looking at, you know, funding astronomy, let's say the black hole, what use is that? How do you explain that to a politician? Japan is investing in basic science. So to me, and I mentioned they, so the fact that they've been winning at least one Nobel every year for the last decade, this is what it means to me. And I think it has something to do with the technology uh, uh, advance uh, as well. But you cannot use this as a reliable proxy. Collectively over a long period of time, perhaps. But you cannot say, like, you know, uh, how come this year you don't have, and this is next year Japan doesn't win a Nobel Prize. Is that, does that signal a, a downward trend? No, I mean, it's sort of a, Black Swan event, you know, in a way. That's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. But I certainly want cows to win a Nobel Prize in the future. <laughs> That's for sure. It will help my job to convince uh, our stakeholders <laughs> of their investment. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think every university would love to have uh, Nobel Prizes awarded to their faculty members. Uh, it's the gold standard uh, of achievements in terms of research. Uh, there's no question about that. But of course, uh, Nobel Prizes yeah. have a much, much longer uh, runway. You look at the age of the Nobel Prize winners, uh, that gives you an indication, all right? Um, but uh, you need actually better to look at the lead indicators, right? Uh, and lead indicators are those that typically are used, I would say, uh, say research statistics, uh, and citations, these are the more lead indicators, right? That are indicative of the trend, right? Uh, Japan is a very interesting uh, example. Um, my sense is that they have benefited a lot uh, during the years after the Second World War uh, and up to, of course, uh, currently. Uh, and uh, I think the trajectory is very different. Right, the trajectory was much steeper uh, in the years, say, from the 50s to the 80s. But I think uh, the, the trajectory has changed after the 80s and 90s. Right? And you can also, by looking at statistics uh, of how many Japanese academics are trained overseas, right? In the period, say, between after the Second World War uh, up to 1990, uh, they have a lot of academics that are trained outside of Japan, right? Uh, but the numbers have actually been declining. And I think this would be a concern because uh, one of the key things of scholarship is that you have to be global. You have to, you know, to be trained in diverse places uh, and uh, learn the best from everywhere because talents are actually very well spread all across the world. Right. So that, there's a difference in I, the trajectory. Yes. Darshan, I have one more thing to say about... Go ahead. I, about the Nobel. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so in a way, you know, this issue about whether Nobel is a KPI and so on has some implication about how university leaders should, should act. So because, you know, our job in China, I don't know whether you agree, you know, we have to, we are between our stakeholders and our faculty member and students, right? So we have to convince our stakeholders. So government, for example, right? Because 
say politicians and so on, they may not be scientists. Most of them are not. So if you say, okay, just wait a, uh, wait a century, they, they don't understand that. But it's our job to explain to them, okay? And also when we see faculty who are pursuing something that we think as academic is worth pursuing, our job is to support that. And we make the case to our stakeholders. We don't take the easy way out, so to speak, right? If you just listen to that. Uh, and sometimes it takes decades. So I think the, the good university, I mean in the long run, will have leaders who understand that and are willing to, to lay their body down, you know, to, to, to protect that kind of academic mission and, and explain to the best possible. I'll give you another example, another Nobel. So the Caltech won the Nobel Prize in gravitational waves a few years ago. And I'm familiar with that because when I work in NSF, we were involved in funding them. And I've known uh, the Kip Thorn is one of the, the uh, and uh, Barry Barrows. I know both of them, okay? And they were working on this literally for like three decades. Even when I was an undergrad, I knew they were working on this problem, okay? When, they were un when I was an undergrad, this is like, I don't know, 50 years ago, okay? And they may not have won it in their lifetime, right? It, it cannot be, you have to win it when you are alive. So they went into this not because they win the Nobel Prize, because they really want to make a contribution to science. So Caltech actually supported this, okay? Caltech stick, stuck, has stuck with them. And this speaks a lot about what kind of institution it is, okay? And I want if there's some politicians, government official listening in, please listen to this. This is the most important. Government, you know, universities have a long time scale and you have to support that mission. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for reading. Time, uh, I, mean, I fully agree with you. Uh, I think there's one thing about having a community that can recognize talent. Right? If your community is mature enough, they can identify a talent. Uh, and uh, our job is to make sure that uh, we sort of facilitate the talent in doing what they are doing. And of course, one of the key things is to make sure that uh, funding for basic research uh, uh, continues because all of us know that uh, basic research is very fundamental and foundational uh, to many innovations and many breakthroughs that are to come, right? And basic research takes a much longer time to be able to see uh, applications uh, and uh, universities are really the best place where you can have top talents working in uh, very foundational basic research. And it is our role to make sure that uh, we facilitate them and like you said, protect them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no more follow-up? Okay. Now I can talk all night. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure there is. There is. I, I think there is no doubt that universities in Asia uh, are basically profoundly endowed by the Eastern, Western, in some sense, also the Arabic civilizations. Your experiences are truly unique among the world of higher education today. The graduates in the universities, led by the two of you both in Asia, about, well, both in East Asia and in West Asia or the Arabic world. Uh, you, are, you, you have what are the, your students are the creme de la creme, not only coming from the uh, respective countries, but from all countries or all corners of the world. And you are increasing your international participation. Therefore, how do higher education in Asia in general, uh, your universities in particular, could be the century, centers to nurture your graduates or your products so that they can play a fundamental and important role in the increasingly convoluted, complex, and, transform and transformative world? Mm -hmm. I, if I can uh, sort of uh, share my points, uh, I, I think uh, the 
questioner is the right to say that the world is actually getting to be more convoluted. Uh, but I think universities, we should stand for what we feel is correct. And we are in a position to do so. Uh, that global orientation and the global collaboration and connection will be very critical for universities. And I think universities should uh, uh, make a very strong stand, right? So we should continue with our exchanges of faculty members. We should continue with our exchanges of students. We should continue with our collaborations in research. Uh, uh, universities must continue to do that. And uh, particularly for Asia, uh, I would like to make a pitch that uh, uh, there is actually tremendous uh, expertise as well as uh, uh, depth in Asian universities, right? Uh, and this is also a very good time for all of us to try to complement one another uh, within Asia. Uh, together, I think we can grow stronger. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can come in? Sure, go ahead. So, uh, Dashan, since you mentioned uh, the, you know, Arab world, you know, and uh, Islamic world, actually, that's uh, even bigger. Uh, so one of Kao's mission, I want to mention Kao's, right, because that's where I am. Uh, one of it is to resurrect the house of wisdom. That's what I say. You know, a thousand years ago, when Europe was in the dark ages, you know, the culture, the knowledge from the, the Greeks and so on were really preserved in the Islamic world. Like Baghdad was really the center. You know, you have a library in Alexandria and all that. So, so the, new, the new house of wisdom, that's what is a beacon to the world. So if you come to cows, you see a big beacon, you know, like a tower. It's to represent the ambition, the vision to attract the best from around the world, regardless of what they do, to allow them to pursue knowledge. That's the idea, okay? So that's a grand vision. We'll see, uh, and, it, and another part of the culture is to bridge culture. So the idea when you have people coming from around the world, they may stay, they may leave, and, but they will bridge culture wherever they are. I think in this complicated, convoluted world, we need more and more of these. So for example, just speaking from my personal experience, before I came to Kaust, uh, I already had some knowledge about this part of the world because I was on the board, okay? But I can tell you most of my friends, personal friends, professional friends, from either Hong Kong, Asia, or from the US, have no idea, have never been to Saudi Arabia, have hardly been to the Middle East. In fact, the, the typical reaction when I told them I'm coming to cows, they said, where is that? I say Saudi Arabia, they would say, oh, I've been to Dubai because they probably transferred through Emirates <laughs> to Dubai. So when I told them, you know, Dubai is three hours from, by flight from where I am. They said, wow, I had no idea. I thought you were just, you know, in the neighborhood. So this, this whole idea is, so you can imagine, right, in the future when the world is more integrated, okay, you really need graduates. So I was, do you want, let's say you are a university in the region, do you want your graduates for now or for the future? If you want your graduate to be the one who will bridge these gaps, to be leaders in whatever they will be, and be able to, you know, represent the, the, the alma mater in a, in a very good way, then you will sort of educate and admit the student in a different way. By the way, the, the West, say the US and the UK in particular, have really blossomed and leveraged off this, right? So we all three were part of the product of that. And we are now ambassadors in some way, right, of uh, that whole system. And I think that Asian universities, we really have to keep that in mind, okay? You, you, you really, you want your graduates, let's say 20, 30, 40 years from now, they will be doing great. And they are your ambassador. And that is something that money cannot buy. You're planting seeds, that's the idea. Mm. Yep. Uh, we are coming up to our 90-minute uh, 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 limit, so we probably have to uh, 
I have to summarize roughly what we have discussed so far, although that's a very difficult topic. I think that there is no doubt that Eng Chai and Tony have given us a glimpse of what Asian universities are facing and are doing at the moment so that they could someday, and maybe very close to it, lead the world in higher education, the meaning of higher education. Uh, I have said once in, um, in Malaysia that higher education is de facto the pulse of the nation. Uh, and if, if the pulse is strong, so is the nation. And therefore higher education plays a fundamental, not just intellectual role, but in how the society is being shaped and how the society moves into the future because you are producing the people that will be running or governing or working in the society. And so I think that what Tony and Eng Chai have uh, professed today as, as professors they are, and, and that is they have really outlined a very important role of how the government should work with universities, especially the public universities. Even the private universities have to work with the government also. And how the um, university can play a role in industrialization of the, com of, of the country or, or the region. I think the most important is how universities can project to the entire society, if not the region, if not the world, the fundamental importance of our understanding of knowledge. You know, I don't know whether people realize this, in Chinese, uh, the word knowledge, which is xue wen, and if you, if you translate it directly into, into English, it means learn how to ask. In other words, you have to learn how to ask before you can learn how to learn. And therefore, university must be the place where difficult questions are asked, not necessarily always be answered, where the difficult questions are allowed. In other words, you are not just going to be a university that uh, will follow what the government tells you to do. After all, we all know that uh, just after the World War II, there is this thing called the Bell Laboratories in the United States. And Bell Laboratory at that, that time, of course, is a big company, in fact, the only company for telecommunications. And um, they just set up these laboratories because they have so much money. They, they throw the best people into those institutes and say, you know, carry out curiosity research. And, uh, and, and then, what came out of it were three physicists who probably never thought that semiconductor will one day govern our entire, including what we are doing now. You know, if, if there's no semiconductors, we cannot be doing what we are doing. So in other words, the basic knowledge of, of science, of human, of, of social, social science and, and philosophies are all intermingled within a university and how a university needs to pursue. And I think both Eng Chai and Tony have given very, very good answers to these questions. Now, Tony and Eng Chai, you want to follow up on this summary? Uh, you have given a very good one. You did a great oh. job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, let's see whether we can find one more questions uh, to end this. By the way, there are a lot of things on the chat and on the q and No, just, there's a huge amount. So I don't know, we, we will never be able to get to them. That's right, that's right. Let me just throw one out randomly. Thank you all three panelists and other attendees for participating in the meaningful discussion. May each of you continue to strive for the advancement of higher education in Asia and around the world. 
Well, I think that's a good comment. Oh, that's not a question. Our, that's a good place to end. Uh, Thank you very much, whoever asked that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Well, let's see what his name is. Uh, I, I, I lost it now. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I think that uh, this will be recorded and will be put into YouTube uh, in the for, in in the near future. Uh, again, uh, Enchai, you want to have one last sentence of words? Let's go grow together. <laughs> Tony, same, same. Really, again, uh, uh, privilege. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Max for her, for his uh, technical support, and I think I will call this to an end. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.